It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. We miss you, indeed. We miss you being in New Orleans. We also miss doing what New Orleanians so often do best, welcoming you to our city, telling you about our favorite places, and watching you truly experience the absolute beauty and indescribable magic of this incredibly special place. Everything that you know and love about New Orleans is not only here waiting for you, but it's better than ever. We have been busy getting ready for your arrival and have considered every detail of your visit with world-class dining, a brand new airport, new museums and attractions, and hotels to fit your every need and desire. Our world-class convention center is completing a beautiful new pedestrian park and is beginning renovations to other facilities. We'll even have gumbo on the stove in our New Orleans. We love you. Just know that we're thinking of you here in the Crescent City. And we can't wait to see you soon. Love New Orleans. When people come, they never leave. 
because we're swinging that way. The sun shines so, so bright. The breeze is so, so nice. Visualizations are about visual patterns, but there's more, much more. We show the connections between more than 100 arguments on why visualization works. And don't forget to check out our website. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. This has been successfully helping not only experts, but also people who want to learn about AI. At VAST 2018, we presented GANLAB, an interactive tool for learning about a deep learning model called GAN. But how does this help these learners? We conducted two evaluation studies, including log analysis of our demo used by over 100,000 people. We will be sharing our findings with you. Hi, everybody. I'm Hank Childs from the University of Oregon. I'm the session chair. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, or for those across the dateline, early Saturday morning. Uh, we have an exciting session uh, today on volume visualization. And our first speaker is David Gross from TU Dresden. He'll be telling us about advanced rendering of line data with ambient occlusion and transparency. Hello. My name is David Gross, and I will be presenting our work Advanced Rendering of Line Data with Ambient Occlusion and Transparency. The efficient rendering of 3D line sets is a highly active research topic, with data emerging, for example, from flow simulations or medical research. With ever increasing complexity, important details are often hidden from direct view. Transparency is thus needed to reveal those details, which would have otherwise been occluded by outside layers. Additionally, we employ ambient inclusion to help with the perception of depth and structure of the geometry. Let's begin with an overview of our rendering technique. Lines are drawn as a series of connected segments using GPU-based ray casting to allow for high quality with minimal geometry input. We chose cone stumps with spherical end caps as primitives, which we call rounded cones. They allow for varying radius and provide smooth connections between two consecutive segments. GPU ray casting works by drawing the proxy geometry to provide fragments which will be tested for intersection with the implicit geometry. A simple bounding box would always work for that purpose, but using simpler geometry helps to improve performance. As our first contribution, we provide a formulation to calculate few aligned quadrilaterals for rounded cones. Here we see a top and front view on an example rounded cone with its start and end spheres. Our goal is to create a camera facing billboard that covers the whole silhouette of the cone. Using the viewpoint and the cone's main axis, a view dependent coordinate system can be constructed for the start and end point. To account for perspective, the sphere's radius needs to be corrected as shown in the illustration at the bottom. Using the original radius and the distance to the camera, a correction factor r over t is calculated, which allows the computation of the projected radius for any distance. We can then create points P0 to P3 on the intersection between tangent view lines and the camera facing center plane of each sphere. The outermost two points are chosen as the basis for extending the quad. To choose the offset from the main axis, 
We can, however, not use r-0 or 1 respectively, because part of the cone would be cut off as shown by the red dotted line. We have to make a conservative adjustment by choosing the radius with the largest projection for both endpoints. We now know how to render the segments themselves, but how do we do so using transparency? Following the approach of auto-based transparency, the individual segments are sorted by the distance to the camera via a fast GPU-based radix sort. However, compositing front to back based on auto alone produces incorrect results in difficult situations. For example, how do we resolve this situation? Rendering the brown line first will produce correct results in one part of the image, but wrong results in another part. It gets even more difficult if you look at the overlapping areas. To overcome this issue, we make use of a per pixel K buffer to intermediately store produced fragments. Following the idea from Liu et al, the fragments are sorted upon insertion into this buffer. Contrary to them, we use def descending order so that the last element is always the one closest to the camera. For practical reasons, the buffer needs to be limited in size and will overflow if too much fragments are generated. At that point, the overflowing entries will be blended to the image. A single shader invocation can only output one value. Because we start with an empty buffer, that means the first k entries end up in the buffer and no output is produced. After the geometry pass processed all segments, we end up with most fragments blended to the image and some missing, which are still inside the k-buffer. Those are blended to the final image in a simple k-buffer flush pass. Now, doing this on the GPU poses problems as shaders are executed in parallel. Multiple fragments falling on the same pixel could be produced at the same time, so sorting fragments in their respective per pixel k list must be serialized. This can be achieved by packing depth and color into a single 64-bit value and using atomic operations for data exchange as described by Liu. Another problem arises due to the fact that one primitive might output color values from another primitive as a result of reordering the fragments in the k-buffer. We have to create a critical region in the shader and guarantee execution order with the help of the fragment shader interlock extension. At last, due to the nature of rounded cones, they produce overlaps when rendered transparent, which are visible as spheres of higher opacity. This issue is easily fixable by creating clipping planes at the start and end points of each segment with, with normals calculated from the adjacent points. The intersection point is then evaluated and only deemed valid if it lies between the clipping planes. To improve the overall perception of the dataset, we incorporate ambient occlusion into our visualizations. We therefore adopt the previous method as presented by Steibedal. The cones are rasterized into a 3D voxel grid, which then represents the spatial density of the dataset in each grid cell. During rendering, voxel cone tracing is performed to calculate the occlusion factor. The result can be seen in the images below, which both show opaque renderings. On the left, no ambient occlusion is applied, while in the picture on the right, lines are emphasized and cavities more visible. We also present an optimization to our rendering approach. When using transparency, the early C test of the graphics pipeline is inactive. Thus, every single primitive is rasterized, even if it might not be visible due to mostly opaque layers in front. Since we already sort the primitives, we can use this to our advantage and implement a culling mechanism by splitting the rendering into depth slices. Each slice will provide opacity information of all the geometry that has been drawn so far. Using this opacity information, we can discard all primitives from rendering that do not contribute to the final image because they are hidden behind opaque layers. After each slice is drawn, we have the opacity information from that slice and all previously drawn slices. A mipmap pyramid is built by taking the minimum opacity value of each four texels that are combined to form the next level texel. This mipmap is used during the rendering of the next slice. First, we create a screen space aligned bounding box from the few aligned billboard of each cone. Using the size of this bounding box in screen space, 
An appropriate mid-map level is chosen, so that it covers 4 texels at most. The 4 opacity values are fetched and compared to a threshold of 95%. Only if all opacity values are above the chosen threshold, we can safely discard this primitive. Now that we know how the rendering is done, let's speak about some results. Segment counts reach from 100,000 to almost 40 million to cover a wide range of possible workloads. Our test machine was equipped with a NVIDIA RTX 2080 Ti with 11GB of video memory. All tests were performed at a resolution of 1920 by 1080 with buffer size K set to 4 and in the case of culling, 10 depth slices have been used. We compared rendering transparent tubes without and with culling. Culling can help to improve performance, especially on dense datasets. The effect is less pronounced on highly transparent renderings, like the aneurysm or non-uniform shaped scenes, like the convection layer. It is even counterproductive for the propeller, as this dataset is too sparse. In those cases, not enough primitives could be culled to amortize the performance loss from building the mipmaps. Enabling ambient occlusion lowers rendering performance as expected, since we need to perform voxel comb tracing for all visible fragments. Further, we compared our method to two state-of-the-art approaches in transparent line rendering. First of which is multi-layer alpha blending with depth bucketing, which does not use visibility sorted objects. Second is voxel ray casting. Here the lines are discretized into a voxel grid and GPU accelerated ray casting is performed. We compared the performance of MLABDB and voxel ray casting to our method for four of our test datasets. The evaluation shows mixed results with no method being clearly faster than the others. Overall, our method achieves similar performance as the existing ones, with one notable outlier being the Clouds dataset. The three methods also show differences in quality. To illustrate this, these images show a close-up view of the Turbulence dataset, with zoomed-in detail views on some interesting areas. We can find subtle differences in transparency between MLABDB and both VRC and our method, with some of the internal layers shining through. Voxel ray casting produces correct transparency, but also has visible discretization artifacts, which are highly dependent on the chosen grid resolution. Our method does not suffer from this and produces a higher quality image. For some datasets, this does however come at the cost of increased render times. In conclusion, we presented a method for high quality line rendering, producing interactive frame rates for up to millions of line segments. We provide a formulation to create simple proxy geometry for rounded cone primitives. Our approach to transparency produces correct results in most situations. There are however some limitations which are not shown in this presentation. For discussion on that, I'd like to refer you to our paper. I would like to round up this talk with a quick demonstration. Here we see the aneurysm dataset, which is currently rendered opaque. In this state, we cannot see internal details. If you now turn on ambient occlusion, we can make out the individual lines easier and see deeper grooves inside of the dataset. To gain insight on the internals, we have to turn on transparency. Now with transparency enabled, we see the swirls which are present inside of the dataset. Okay. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for that.
Okay, David, thank you for that great talk. Um, we already got one question early in the talk from Alexander Bach. He asks, how do you specify the clipping planes to prevent the doubling of the opacity when rendering many line segments at the same time? Doing this separately, separately for each primitive would be prohibitively expensive, no? Yeah, actually the clipping planes are not stored explicitly in memory um, because we do an indexed rendering and are using the geometry shader we are actually able to fetch the information of the previous and next line segment for each ground segment, and then pass this information onto the fragment shader, where we actually do the intersection routine. And so the clipping planes are only defined for each segment and will only uh, affect this individual segment. Okay, uh, good. Uh, thanks, I think hopefully that clears it up. If not, uh, Alice yeah, can ask an additional question. Um, you know, I have a, a question as well. Um, it's more of a curiosity. Um, I noticed that uh, to make sure that the fragments came in the right order, um, as you had many threads operating on fragments, you had to um, use atomics and serialize that. What sort of performance penalty is there? I mean, I understand if you just let everyone dump their fragments in it, you'd get the wrong picture, but, but how much does it cost to do that? How much faster would it be if you didn't do it? where well, you actually would be able to just uh, render it through a naive transparency approach by just sorting. Mm -hmm. And there actually is quite a high performance penalty in serializing this. Okay. Um, actually, I don't have the exact number right in front of me, um, but I say it's at least half the performance. Interesting. Good. So uh, ha getting it right uh, has a cost. Okay, uh, yeah. very good. I'm looking at the Discord channel and um, I see a lot of positive feedback, but no further questions. So David, great job. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll move on to our next talk. All right, thanks. Michael, will you turn on your video? Great. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Michael Kern from TU Munich. Um, and he will be telling us about a comparison of rendering techniques for 3D line sets with transparency. Hello, my name is Michael Kern, and I will present our work about the comparison of rendering techniques for 3D line sets with transparency. In visualization, scientists often come across large line sets. For instance, these lines represent pathways of particles in a flow feed, where each point along the pathway is assigned with a physical attribute. If the features are not known beforehand, a common way is to use transparency to reveal hidden features of interest while fading out the surrounding context. However, among the existing techniques, it is not clear which technique should be used to render large line sets efficiently while supporting transparency rendering. In this work, we provide an extensive evaluation study to compare transparency rendering techniques. The selected techniques are mainly designed to render large 3D line sets. With dense 3D line sets, we enforce a high depth complexity in the scene, which means that there is a high number of fragments per pixel that need to be blended in correct visibility order. We further use transfer functions to map physical attributes along the lines to transparency and color to simulate a typical exploration task in visualization. All the techniques are then compared by means of their memory consumption and runtime performance. Finally, we conduct a quantitative and qualitative image comparison study to reason about the quality of each technique. We further provide enhanced and novel techniques to render line sets. For instance, we introduce sorting algorithms to improve the runtime performance of per pixel linked lists. We also enhance multi layer alpha blending and divide our scene into depth buckets to improve the image quality. And we provide an implementation to use GPU accelerated ray tracing to render transparent line sets on the latest NVIDIA RTX graphics cards. Finally, we give recommendations on the suitability of each technique by means of the complexity of a line set and the use transparency and color settings during rendering. First of all, I want to talk about the test environment we have used to conduct our comparison study. We selected four line datasets with varying size and complexity to simulate different types of scenarios. For instance, the number of lines ranges from 10k lines for the streamlines in an aneurysm over 100k lines in a raleigh Banach convection and turbulence field to 400k streamlines extracted from a large eddy simulation in clouds. For the comparison, we further use three transparency settings. 
First, the lines are either rendered fully opaque, as shown at the top of the images. Second, the lines are rendered semi-transparent, that is, features of interest are kept fully opaque while the remaining lines are faded out. Or three, all lines are rendered fully transparent with overall low opacity. For many algorithms, the lines are also transformed into triangulated tubes beforehand to provide the best runtime performances. We have implemented several techniques in OpenGL and GLSL to conduct our comparison study. One type of the techniques is called object order. Object order techniques are based on rasterization, where all the fragments per pixel have to be sorted and blended in correct visibility order. On the one hand, there is exact methods that are able to correctly blend transparent objects. Here we use def peeling as ground truth for image comparison, but exclude the algorithm from further studies as its runtime performance is very slow. We also use per pixel linked lists as it is commonly used in computer graphics and visualization. On the other hand, there are approximate techniques that, for instance, blend fragments heuristically. Here we chose multi-layer alpha blending, including our depth bucketing and moment-based order independent transparency. The second variant is called image order. Here we should race from the pixel grid into the scene. The correct visibility order of objects is implicitly given along the ray. Hence, we can simply perform front-to-back blending. There are also two types of algorithms. First, we use Osprey CPU ray tracing and RTX-based GPU ray tracing to correctly render transparent line sets. Second, we use voxel-based ray casting to traverse a compressed voxelization of line sets. Having listed all the techniques used in our study, I will now briefly explain each single algorithm. Per pixel linked lists were introduced by Young and All in 2010 and uses two buffers. The node buffer stores all the gathered fragments where each fragment additionally stores the pointer to the next fragment in the list. The head buffer stores the reference to the first fragment of the linked list for each pixel. With this, order independent transparency can be implemented via a two pass algorithm. In the first pass, all fragments are gathered and stored in the node buffer. In the second pass, each linked list per pixel is sorted and blended in correct visibility order. Unfortunately, this algorithm has two problems. First, it assumes that device memory is unlimited and each fragment can be stored, which is not true for scenes with high def complexity. Second, the sorting of fragments per pixel is a severe performance bottleneck, which makes the algorithm unsuitable for higher complex and larger scenes. To address the problem with sorting, we implemented several sorting algorithms and compared them with respect to performance. During a pre-recorded flight, where we rotate around the object while zooming in and out, we discovered that the classical algorithms, such as bubble and search and sort, suffer from high variation in performance. This is mainly due to the fact that their performance is in ON squared which provides worse performance for close-up views of the data, as indicated by the peak in the graph. Shell sort and priority queue, however, perform sorting on smaller buffers or use a min-heap data structure to sort the fragments respectively. These sorting algorithms could greatly improve the runtime performance and showed stable results. Next, multi-layer alpha blending, also called MLAP, is an approximate technique to render transparent objects. It assumes bound memory on devices and stores a fixed number of fragments per pixel in a so-called blending array. This array stores the color, transmittance and distance from the viewer, and all elements of the array are sorted according to the distance. If the blending array is full, all new inserted fragments are merged heuristically, for instance by means of transmittance and distance. While this algorithm works for a low number of transparent layers, it introduces artifacts and produces incorrect results due to heuristic merges for large datasets as it can be seen on the left image. Hence, we wanted to find a way to improve the algorithm to weaken the effect of incorrect fragment merges, as it can be seen on the right image. We therefore introduced depth bucketing. Assuming that a semi-transparent rendering setting is used, we propose to divide the scene into two depth buffers, a front and a back buffer. The front buffer covers all highly transparent fragments that are close to the viewer and located before any features of interest. The back buffer then contains all highly opaque fragments that highlight the features of interest. To perform the blending, we now conduct MLAP for both buffers independently and then merge their results to obtain the final pixel color. Note that all fragments located behind opaque layers are discarded here. Another approximate technique is called moment-based order independent transparency. It was introduced by Münstermann and al. and builds upon power and trigonometric moments to approximate the per pixel transmittance function stochastically. It also uses the logarithm of the transmittance to enable additive blending to enforce order independency. For further details, we refer to the paper of the authors. Voxel-based raycasting is an image order approximate technique recently proposed by Kanzler et al. 
It uses a voxelization-based representation of line sets and compression to provide a representation of the data at low memory costs. Ray casting can then be used to traverse this representation and to obtain the hits with analytic line tubes. With this, it also supports global illumination effects and empty space skipping. For CPU ray tracing, we use Intel's Osprey rendering library to render line sets. Here, lines are typically represented by analytic cylinders and sphere primitives. For higher order curves, Embry's built in PC curve primitives can be used. Recently, Hahn et al. introduced their generalized tube primitives to support tubes of varying radii, bifurcations, and transparency. In our study, we used Embry and Hahn's method to trace against triangulated and analytical troops. For GPU ray tracing, we used Vulkan's ray tracing interface to render transparent line sets on the latest RTX graphics cards. Here, any hit shaders support the implementation of transparency rendering. However, the order in which these any hit shaders are called along the ray traversal is not guaranteed to follow the correct visibility order. Hence, we opted for an iterative approach. Here, we propose to iteratively shoot rays from hit to hit and sequentially perform front to back blending in the ray generation shader. With this, we could successfully render all line sets while supporting transparency. After the introduction of all techniques, I will finally present the results of our comparison study. First, we examined how much memory is required for each technique to make the line sets renderable, and we also measured the times needed to build the renderable representations. Here, our object order techniques in OSP mainly depend on buffers required to describe the triangular meshes of the data, which means the memory consumption scales with the line set size. OSP does not require much more additional memory except for the cloud dataset. RTX, on the other hand, requires acceleration structures on the GPU to describe the hierarchy of access line bounding boxes. Therefore, it consumes much more memory to handle the datasets. VRC consumes the least memory as it compresses the line sets to a reduced representation. However, its build times are highest as the preprocess is much more time consuming here. In addition to that, some techniques require more memory during animation to store and blend gathered fragments and buffers. Here, VRC, OSP, and RTX are low as they implicitly obtain the fragments in correct order and can simply perform alpha blending. Mboid and MLabDB use constant amount of memory as they only store a few fragments per pixel. Linked lists, however, consume drastically much more memory during animation as they have to store every fragment in the scene. For close-up views, LL consumes up to 4 GB of data at full HD resolution, which in addition to the renderable representation can easily exceed the memory limits. Next, we have also measured the runtime performance of each technique with respect to the transparency settings. For fully opaque lines, all techniques perform well, as they can early stop the gathering and blending operations. Linked list, however, has to handle all the fragments first, which means that its performance becomes even worse for large datasets, as indicated by the red curve. The fastest algorithms here are the image order techniques, which benefit from early ray termination at the first hit with the line. For semi-transparent settings, image order techniques now have to traverse the dataset until they hit an opaque feature or leave the domain, which leads to a worse performance. However, we discovered that RTX can make use of hardware accelerated rate triangle tests and still shows very good performances, around 100 milliseconds per frame. VRC is also quite stable and here only shows only a slight decrease in performance. OSP, in contrast, shows worse performance here and exceeds 1.5 seconds per frame. The performances of all other techniques remain quite stable. For highly transparent lines, approximate object order techniques now perform best for all datasets and are always superior to the image order techniques. However, note that in this scenario, RTX and VRC are even able to beat per pixel linked lists. OSP is unfortunately not able to compete with the other techniques and shows the worst performance. For visual quality, we have rendered the datasets by rotating the camera around the center of the data to see the frame-to-frame -frame coherency. Here, the renderings of all object order techniques can be seen. Although the approximate techniques could in theory produce visual artifacts, we have not experienced any flickering during animation. At this frame, one can see that some of the hidden features are suddenly popping out, as from this viewing angle, fragments are either incorrectly merged, as seen with the MLAP, or the transparency is underestimated with MBOID, as it can be seen here.
We have also used close-up views during animation to spot the visual differences between techniques. Here, the depth complexity and per pixel errors are shown below the rendering results of all approximate techniques. For Emboid, one can see in the yellow rectangle that the transmittance is underestimated and faded out features are more highlighted. MLEDT suffers from merging errors and produces distorted yellowish colors. VRC produces a lot of per pixel errors because the silhouette of the compressed lines does not exactly match the outline of original lines. However, the visual quality of VRC is nearly perfect. In summary, the attained insights are Exact object order techniques have perfect visual quality, but consume a high amount of memory at low runtime performance. Approximate techniques, on the other hand, have low memory requirements, high runtime performance, but produce visual artifacts depending on the angle of view. Nevertheless, their image quality is acceptable, as we have shown in a user study. Exact image order techniques have perfect image quality and high performance for opaque lines. The GPU-based solution showed good performance for transparent lines, while the CPU ray tracing was too slow to provide real-time rendering. GPU ray tracing also consumes much more memory to store the acceleration structures. BRC had reconstruction errors due to compression, which however did not have an impact on the image quality, which is nearly perfect, and it consumes much less memory than all other techniques. Transparent line renderings often fail to communicate spatial relations between lines. Hence, in the future, it would be interesting to combine transparency with global illumination effects, such as ambient occlusion or soft shadows, to enhance the visual perception. This can easily be implemented, for instance, with CPU and GPU ray tracing. In further studies, it will be then interesting to shed light on the questions, does the transparency rendering of large line sets have a positive effect on the user's perception? Or is it always beneficial to prefit the lines beforehand? Last but not least, how does global animation affect the visual interpretation of transparent lines? To conclude, we provided a summary table in our paper to indicate which technique should be used in which scenario to help the readers to identify the most suitable rendering algorithms. We have also made all the datasets and implementations publicly available on GitHub and Synodo. I also want to thank the DFG and Waves to Weather for funding this exciting research project. And finally, I want to thank all the students involved in this project for their outstanding work to make this paper possible. With that, I want to thank you for listening and I'm now ready to take questions. Okay, Michael, thank you for the uh, great talk. Um, you, we, you did use most of your 15 minutes for that talk. Uh, we had a question oh, yeah. <laughs> that was asked and, and retracted um, about the flickering and looking at per pixel errors across the video. Do you wanna to speak to that really quickly before we move on? So basically we didn't experience any flickering uh, during animation. So we looked at per pixel errors and also recorded all the um, error metrics and with that, we couldn't experience any peaks or any uh, yeah, obvious errors in that case. It was always smooth. If, if an approximation technique uh, did not reconstruct the transparency correctly, then it went smoothly on during animation, so you couldn't see any yep. mismatch there. Very good. Very good. Well, congratulations on the great work. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll need to move on in the interest of time. Um, our next speaker is Daniel Preuss right. uh, from the University of Duisburg Essen and he'll be telling us about a discrete probabilistic approach to dense flow visualization. Welcome to my talk, discrete probabilistic approach to dense flow visualization. Dense flow visualization, particularly the line integral convolution, has proven successful in scientific and engineering applications. Its wide popularity is the result of such features as suitability for efficient parallel implementation on graphics hardware and the possibility to use adaptive resolution. They provide useful information about the structure of the underlying flow. However, the flow transport is not appropriately visualized. So, it is challenging to interpret the connectivity between different points in the flow. We present a new dense flow visualization technique that creates a multi-level hierarchy visualizing the connectivity of points in the flow. 
Before we get to how our method works, let us first examine some of the results. The image you can see here is the first level of our hierarchy with a combination of two components, a line integral convolution output and the visualization of our technique itself. Without the line integral convolution output, it isn't easy to interpret the flow. However, as we see later, by slightly tweaking our technique's pipeline, we achieve those results with minimal overhead. The visualization itself shows the different connected regions in the flow by coloring them. In this first image, the flow separates roughly in the top and bottom half as outlined here. In both areas, the flow exhibits similar behavior, but the streamlines are only coarsely related. Now, as we gradually increase the hierarchy's level, our technique separates the flow in regions with higher correlation and the streamlines become more and more alike. For example, as we can see in the fourth level, the outlined area comprises streamlines with close to identical behavior. So, how do we achieve those results? What you see here is a diagram of all the different processes involved in our technique. For the first step, we calculate the streamlines for all pixels and store them as rows in a matrix. We start with the continuous formulation commonly used in the line integral convolution. That is, the output at a specific pixel is the integral over an input signal multiplied by the chosen kernel function. The input signal is evaluated at the streamlines points over a given distance in both directions and the kernel function is evaluated at those distances. As usual, we discretize this formulation. Therefore, we consider a finite number of particle positions sampled at different distances along the streamline. We then can interpolate the input signal by defining uj as the input signal's value at cell cj and wj as the interpolation weight used at cell cj for a given particle position. Now, instead of directly throwing the flow field, input signal and kernel function in this equation as we will do for the line integral convolution, we go a step further. By changing the order of sums, we can reformulate this equation into a basic matrix vector multiplication with the matrix P containing the streamline weights for all cells as rows. For the next steps in the pipeline, we first normalize the rows of matrix P by its row sum and after that normalize its columns by the column sum. The normalization of the rows of P corresponds to a normalization of the kernel. Therefore, evaluating the matrix vector product of a noise input texture and P results in similar outputs to the line integral convolution. Hence, the overhead is limited to the number of histogram equalizations and matrix vector products associated with them. Furthermore, the normalization of the rows and columns are crucial to our technique, as we will see in a few minutes. After the streamline calculation, the entries of P correspond to the influence of the blue cells on the purple cell, as shown in figure A. However, we can also interpret this case through a probabilistic model, where a given particle Pi spawning at the purple cell has a fleeting position somewhere on the streamline. Therefore, in the probabilistic setup, the entries of P correspond to the conditional probability that given we observe particle Pi, a specific cell Cj is visited. From this interpretation, it is then natural to switch the focus from particles directly to the cells. This cell-centric view is intuitively illustrated in figure B. Therefore, we are interested in the conditional probability that given the purple cell Cj is observed, particle Pi arrives at this cell. To realize this switch from the particle-centric to the cell-centric view, we apply Bayes' theorem, which is technically implemented by normalizing the rows and columns. Currently, we have a matrix that for a given cell contains for each particle emitted at the other cells the probability that this specific cell is reached. By multiplying this matrix with its transpose, we get a matrix that measures the similarity between cells. The more overlaps the streamlines of both cells have, the higher the similarity. Therefore, for streamlines that are nowhere closer than one cell size apart, the similarity is zero. The last step of the pipeline 
is to apply the spectral embeddings method on this matrix. Hence, we derive the Laplacian matrix from H and calculate its eigenvectors. The Laplacian matrix is defined as the difference between a diagonal matrix D containing the row sums of H as its main diagonal and H. The eigenvectors of L then have a scalar value for each cell in the output image. By applying a color map on those eigenvectors, we get the presented results. In analogy to spectral embeddings, we name those results spectral flow embeddings. Although the results by themselves already visualize to some extent the flow transport, they can be combined into a single image using a transfer function for enhancement of detail on different scales. For this, we estimate amplitudes for all eigenvectors using the LP norms to sort them by their importance to the flow. Then we use the amplitudes divided by the overall sum as weights for all calculated eigenvectors. The combined result is achieved by applying a color map to the sum of those weighted eigenvectors. Again, as we see here, the results are challenging to interpret without the underlying flow structure. Therefore, as already mentioned, we suggest supporting them with line integral convolution outputs. The combination into a single image results in a more straightforward visualization, highlighting the essential regions of intermixing in the flow. For example, for the flow in the middle, we again see the separation of the flow in the top and bottom half, as well as the vortex in the center of the bottom half. Another extension to our technique we investigated the applicability to 3D flows. Since the results are scalar fields computed for each cell of the entire discrete domain, for 3D flows they are volumes, ravers and surfaces and can be visualized using known volume rendering techniques. What makes this visualization method attractive in 3D is that a local region of interest in the flow corresponds to a certain bounded continuous range in the embedding scalar field values making it easy to select and filter. Therefore, in the here shown results, we manually clustered the scalar field values into bounded regions with thresholds where the values jump by adjusting the transparency and color. This clustering results in the separation of the flow into regions where particles interact strongly and the interaction between these regions is low. Furthermore, by setting the transparency to 1, Filtering the regions that cover large parts of the domain and are of no interest is easily done. For the future, we plan to address the limitations currently existent to our technique. At present, our method is verified with a proof of concept, prototypical implementation that works solely on the CPU. However, as the streamline calculation is similar to the process of the line integral convolution, we see a massive possibility improving the performance using accelerated GPU implementations well studied in the line integral convolution. On the other hand, the systematic theoretical treatment of the eigenvector computation might further speed up the processing time, employing effective preconditioners combined with algorithms such as the LOP-PCG algorithm. Due to the sparse nature of the matrices and the linear complexity and the number of non-zero entries of the LOP-PCG method, it seems promising to use our technique on larger data. Applying our method to unsteady flows should be reasonably straightforward. However, the robustness and insightfulness currently are not evident. Nevertheless, the application to unsteady flows seems auspicious and we will analyze them in the future. For the 3D case, using more sophisticated clustering approaches instead of manually clustering the outputs ourselves could lead to even more insight to the connectivity of regions in the flow. On a final note, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Viktor Matvenko for his support in creating the cornerstone for this work. Thank you for your attention. Hi, Daniel. Uh, thanks for that uh, great talk. Um, let's get the Discord up. Um, it says, and so I have similar questions uh, to the people in Discord. It says uh, from Alex, uh, again, Alex, thanks for asking these questions. Maybe I missed it in the talk. 
and my apologies if I did, could you say something about the performance cost of the computations? And so I have some similar questions. You, you ended with that point, uh, meaning that's an area for improvement, but, but how does it look right now? Yeah, currently our implementation is only prototypical. So uh, we just did a CPU implementation and plan to uh, implement a GPU implementation in the future uh, to accelerate the whole thing. And uh, currently it's similar to the line interview convolution um, computations on, of other algorithms. So uh, the uh, complexity is in that uh, way. So, so uh, if it takes a, a day, then a GPU won't help. Yeah, if, it, it's it takes a, if it takes a minute, then a GPU is promising. You know, so you know, in the yeah. paper, we have some uh, examples that we calculated and uh, have the times for them. Mm -hmm. And they're around uh, uh, shortly under one hour to uh, a very little good. bit over an hour. OK, so very it's good. It's not very that good. bad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very good. Very good. Um, and it's not just a matter of, of parallelizing the GPU. You had some other ideas as well. Uh, we have another uh, question uh, from uh, Tushar Athawale. Uh, he says, nice talk uh, for probability computations. Have you experimented with different noise models such as uniform, Gaussian, et cetera, and studied their effect on visualizations? Um, so if I understand that question correctly, it's the uh, kernel function and uh, Currently, we only use the Gaussian function, but uh, using different kernel functions uh, is something we could investigate in the future as well. Okay, very good. Very good. Well, uh, Daniel, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, congratulations on your paper. Uh, we're gonna move on to our, our next speaker. So uh, thank you. And our next speaker is uh, Stefan Zellman from the University of Cologne. And his talk is titled Ray Tracing Structured MR Data Using Exabrix. Hey, everyone. So today's talk is going to be about AMR ray tracing on GPUs using a novel data structure. Let me first give you a brief motivation. Huge AMR data sets are prevalent today in the simulating sciences. Memory bandwidth and memory capacity just haven't kept up with growth in raw compute power over the last years. So people use AMR to focus the computation on the more interesting parts. Take for example the jet data sets here on those slides. If that were a structured volume with the same level of detail, it'd be 4.8 times 2.4 times 2.1k in size. Instead, this is an AMR data set with cells distributed across four levels and it is still comprised of 1.31 billion individual cells. Rendering those data sets poses a number of challenges. With cell-centered data, cell centers don't line up horizontally, so you can just interpolate linearly at level boundaries. State-of-the-art solutions tackle that with intricate reconstruction algorithms. Those are, however, not well suited for many core architectures and cause all sorts of problems, such as execution divergence and potential cache thrashing. So we are presenting a data structure that can do high quality reconstruction and is optimized for GPU and for many core. And as a bonus, it is easy to convert pretty much every structured AMR format into our format without resampling. So let's have a look at what the state of the art does. Wald and colleagues, for example, support smooth reconstruction at level boundaries. They use a KD tree uh, over partitioning that is based on the original AMR hierarchy. During ray marching with a volume or an isosurface renderer, they have to tra traverse that KD tree per sample taken. So in many core architectures, that might, of course, lead to all sorts of problems. Um, smooth reconstruction is, however, easy to support, as we just have to take eight samples instead of just one. Um, the approach by Kaler is more suited for GPUs. Um, they reorder the hierarchy into bricks of same level cells. Then they build a KD tree over that hierarchy or over those, those, uh, those bricks. Um, they then, traverse, then first traverse the KD tree and only then remarch uh, the bricks that they obtain. Um, with that, it's however not easy to support smooth reconstruction at level boundaries. So we present the Exabrix data structure that combines the two approaches in a clever way. 
We are also using a reordering approach similar to Keller's, so we are fast on GPUs. But we also support smooth interpolation at level boundaries. And on top of that, we can make use of hardware accelerated ray tracing with RTX. The Exabrix data structure is optimized for the basis reconstruction method. Without going into the details here and referring you to Wald's paper, uh, this method performs a convolution where the filter reaches one half uh, cells width beyond the cell's boundaries. So the cell's data values needs to be retrievable at position inside that support and not just inside the cell's actual extent. When building the Exabrix data structure, we, just, we just start out with Kalos bricks of same level cells. We then pad each brick by half a cell's width giving us the BRICS support regions. From those, we build what we call the active BRIC regions. Here, in this concavely shaped region of space, for example, the only active BRIC is BRIC B1. This rectangular active BRIC region here stores pointers to B1 and B2, which both overlap that region. In this AVR, B1, B2 and B4 are active. The problem here is that those regions aren't uh, just there, we have to find them somehow. And uh, they're also concave, which uh, makes them a bit difficult to render. Therefore, we just build another KD tree, but now to find the rectangular axis aligned regions where the bricks overlap. We then again drop uh, that hierarchy and just keep the axis aligned bounding boxes at the leaf nodes. Over those, we build a bounding volume hierarchy with RTX which gives us our final data structure that we'll use for rendering on the GPU. With that, we can trivially implement empty space skipping by storing and classifying the cell ranges with the current transfer function. ABRs that are empty um, not even end up in the RTX BVH at all. We however have to rebuild the BVH whenever the transfer function changes. This is however pretty fast though. Let's have a look at how the data structure can be used for rendering. We're using the typical Cybis rendering modalities such as dirt volume rendering or isosurface rendering, so our workloads are relatively coherent. We at most trace an ambient occlusion ray here and there, but we're mostly dealing with primary rays. We also use the ABRs to support adaptive sampling, which is crucial to um, obtain high performance as we'll otherwise grossly oversample the volume. And for the implementation, we used Optics 7. In the ray generation program, we generate primary rays to trace through the volume. We then find the intersection range of the ABR that is closest to the ray. We look up the bricks that are active inside the ABR. Then ray march the ABR from front to back and use the bricks to determine the cell values along the way. We then shorten the primary array so that we obtain the next closer ABR and repeat that until we have left the volume. We found that the adaptive sampling rates lead to subtle artifacts at level boundaries. Here in the figure, I've plotted a bunch of samples taken along a ray and the distance they're responsible for. With ray A, we see that uh, issue where the small red distance is integrated over twice. While with ray B, we see the opposite problem, where some distances are never even touched by the integrator. We solve this issue by always placing samples in the middle of the ranges and uh, this way guaranteeing that every range is touched at most once. We weigh the sample correction in during opacity correction. So um, the uh, sample correction can seen here on this, be seen here on the slide um, illustrated for ray C. With our sample correction, we see a slight bias as the step size is now no longer uniform. We found this, however, to be much more pleasant than the opacity inconsistencies that we observed otherwise. In the paper, we also propose a fast way to compute analytic gradients from the basis method samples. The formula here presents uh, basis interpolation and the fi values are the samples taken to reconstruct the origin original function at position x. <clears throat> we propose to use the actual partial derivatives of the basis method formula as gradients for local shading. This monster of an equation here shows how to compute those partial derivatives. 
it's not necessary to understand the whole equation. What's going on here is really just a bunch of um, quotient rule applications uh, to compute the derivatives. Um, I, however, want to draw your attention to the fact um, that we just uh, need the exact same samples that are required for basis reconstruction anyway. So this approach is relatively cheap as we don't require additional global memory accesses to the GPU's DDR memory. We compared that with uh, central differences where we have to take six, sam six basis samples uh, instead of just one. While obtaining similar quality, we found analytic, analytic gradients to be three to four times faster than central differences. We have thoroughly evalu evaluated our approach. And we used a bunch of different data sets ranging from astrophysics over fluid dynamics to meteorology. We are of course also testing with the Exajet dataset that I showed earlier. For those uh, 1K viewports here, um, we found frame rates to be interactive all the time. Our data structure is also quite memory efficient. We can even fit the whole Exajet into a single GPU. Those results, by the way, were obtained using two GPUs, but with the dataset uh, replicated on each GPU. Being an image order approach, it also scales extremely well with additional GPUs. For comparison with state-of-the-art methods, uh, we also imported the dataset um, into Osprey. Obtaining an apples-to-apples -apples comparison is of course not that simple. We configured Osprey to either produce images with roughly the same quality or the same frame rate as ours. Osprey does not support adaptive sampling as it uses the approach by Wald and colleagues. Uh, we therefore found our approach to outperform Osprey running on a top-notch server CPU system by up to two orders of magnitude. We also compare ourselves with Valt's approach, um, but on the GPU, and also with adaptive sampling. In contrast to ours, uh, Valt's method has to traverse a KD tree per sample taken, while we just traverse an optics BVH up front. Uh, we beat Valt's approach on the GPU by a factor of 2 to 5x. With that, I come to the conclusions and potential future work. The data structure that we presented is suitable for high-quality, high-performance rendering on GPUs and many core systems. We easily beat the state-of-the-art approaches that we compared with. Our data structure is compatible with all sorts of structured AMR formats. In fact, our prototypical implementation already comes with loaders for a bunch of different formats. Our work is of course not free of limitations. Currently, building the 2KD trees with our approach is an offline process that can take up to a couple of minutes. It thus doesn't lend itself to time-varying data. More future work comprises making better use um, of the GPU's texture texturing subsystem, which we currently don't use at all. Ultimately, it would of course make sense to integrate our data structure into more widely used visualization systems such as Visit or Paraview. This concludes my talk and I'm now happy to take your questions. Okay, uh, Stefan, thanks for the very interesting uh, talk and technique. Um, I encourage people to post questions to the Discord. I will um, start us off though while the questions are coming in. So um, the comparison to Osprey at the end was really an attention getter. You know, of course, I'm familiar with both Optics and Osprey. They're both good software packages. Um, I think the issue is that that you have this new technique that allows you to achieve both quality and performance, right? And so, you know, I, I, you know, that that's why you were able to win as you were doing both at once. But I, I did also, um, or at least that's, that's my understanding as you were doing both at once. And so as you compare on the quality and then the performance was not as good or vice versa, but it sounds like there's a pre-processing time. So, um, you, you know, it, that, that's a, a, a critical component to achieving this success, right? Is that you take the data set, pre-process it, and then you can get both quality and performance at the same time. Do I have it right? Yes, definitely. 
Okay, and and um, so so good, but it still sounds like a tremendous innovation, right? That you can get, you know, quality and performance is what er everybody uh, wants. Um, I, I also was struck by the name Exabricks, so I think of Exascale, and you know, really really big data sets. Um, it sounds like right now it's it's in GPU memory. Uh, did did I get that part of it right as well? That the data set needs to fit in GPU memory, or is there a a staging scheme that I missed? Oh, this is right. Currently, the whole data sets uh, have or uh, one time step has to fit in uh, GPU memory. And Good. you're also right about the processing time. So this is actually like a major to do that we're still having. Um, we have a processing time of like a um, couple of seconds to a couple of minutes, depending on the data set. Like yeah. you, that data set that I showed, which is like, I think, 20, 30 minutes or something. Like other data sets we have is more like uh, like under a minute, a couple of seconds. Um, but I have to say that we didn't, didn't really invest time in optimizing this process. Like this happens on the CPU, uh, this happens in a top-down fashion and it's not very optimized. And um, yeah, I'm quite confident uh, that this can be improved. Like actually many of those data sets are time varying. Yeah? So yeah. Uh, as physics data sets, for example, like you have 400 time steps or something. And uh, that would be really nice to also have, uh, have support for this. And we're actually working on this right now. Well, uh, well, that, that sounds exciting. And, and so then uh, what about, so of course I'm a large data person and GPU memory is, is large, but what, what about going forward, uh, having a, a, you know, being able to rely on CPU memory or, or, you know, is there a plan for supporting even larger data sets than what you can fit in GPU memory? Um, well, what I'm concentrating on currently is like having uh, many time steps. Like this is important for me because I personally, I have like, um, like collaborators who have this kind of data set. And in, uh, I mean, in this regard, it would be important to have like something like streaming that you have, uh, you process uh, a couple of time steps on this, on the GPU, that you have a yeah. couple of time steps in GPU memory, and then you will be able to stream those time steps in order to like have, an, have a smooth animation or something. So um, uh, in regards to that, yeah. Um, in regards to supporting uh, even larger time steps, um, this, I'm currently not thinking too much about this, but of course, we're really also exciting, yeah. Yeah, very good. Very good. Well, Stefan, thank you for the exciting result and talk. Uh, I enjoyed uh, learning about it. Uh, we're going to move on in the interest of, of time, but uh, uh, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Sebastian uh, Matza uh, from TU Vienna, and he will be telling us about homomorphic encrypted volume rendering. My name is Sebastian Matze. I'm from TU Wien and I will present our homomorphic encrypted volume rendering approach. First, I will discuss the problems we want to address with our work. Volume rendering is a memory and computational intensive task. Therefore, it requires powerful workstations and these are expensive and not really mobile. Many thin clients like tablets does not have the resources required for volume rendering. In order to allow a user to examine a volume dataset on a thin client, a theoretical solution could be to run a server with a modern GPU in the local network. Such a server can render images from a volume dataset and stream the images to the clients. However, such a server is probably not cheap and often the bigger problem is it requires regular maintenance. And most of the time on the day, such a server is doing nothing especially in smaller companies or hospitals. In order to overcome this problem, we can just rent the required processing power from a cloud hosting provider exactly then when needed. However, volume datasets often contain sensitive data which should be kept confidential. Imagine a CD or MRI scan of a patient. Even the idea with the rendering and streaming server in the local network must lead to questions like, who has access to the server, or who can copy the volume datasets. So privacy is an even bigger problem if you want to use some offerings of a cloud hosting provider, because realistically, a user or a patient then loses any control of his private and sensitive data. It was the target of our research to make remote volume rendering on untrusted third-party servers possible. The approach should be secure by design. The security should not depend on hiding implementation details or making the algorithms artificially complex or some other obscure techniques which will probably be cracked sooner than later. Our approach should be provable cryptographically secure. Only the owner of the data, who has the private key, should be able to make any use of the data. 
Furthermore, we want to perform all aspects of the volume rendering on the server side. Only the final image should be sent to the client. The support of Syn clients prohibits techniques that perform parts of the rendering on the client side. Not only because of the limited computational power, but also because of the limited network throughput that can be expected from mobile devices. To achieve our goal, we make use of Payless Crypto System. It is a partial homomorphic encryption scheme. That means there exist some operations in the encrypted space that are dual to operations in the plain text space. In the case of Payla, it is possible to perform an operation on two encrypted numbers which are dual to an addition. That means if we encrypt two numbers, apply this Payla add operation to them and decrypt the result, it will be equal to the sum of the two original plain text numbers. Furthermore, Payla supports an operation that can multiply an encrypted number with a plain text number, but Payla does not support the multiplication of two encrypted numbers. If Payla could multiply two encrypted numbers, it would be a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, but it is only a partial homomorphic. Like RSA, Payla is asymmetric and probabilistic. Asymmetric means it uses one key for encryption, the public key, and another key for decryption, which is called private or secure key. During the encryption, the so-called obfuscation adds random noise to the encrypted numbers. This qualifies Payla as probabilistic and is especially important for volume rendering, since that means that every possible density value can be mapped to millions of different encrypted values. And this makes it impossible to find structures in encrypted datasets by searching for equal values. All these nice features are not for free compared to processing with unencrypted plain text numbers. Payla has a considerable overhead in terms of storage and computation, but many magnitudes less than any known fully homomorphic encryption scheme. This is why we use Payla and not a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Based on Payla, we implemented the privacy preserving X-ray rendering. The first part is the encryption. It must be done before the data is uploaded to the server. And it would make sense to do it directly after the data acquisition. During the volume encryption, every single voxel value is encrypted on its own. Metadata like the size of the volume are not encrypted. After the encryption, the dataset is uploaded to the server. Now a client can send a render request for this volume dataset to the server. The request includes camera parameters like the camera position, opening angle, image width and so on. The server uses this camera data to perform a ray casting directly on the encrypted data. After the rendering is completed, the client downloads the rendering result and decrypts it with the secure key. The basic option for the rendering directly on the encrypted data is X-ray rendering with nearest neighbor filtering. If we use nearest neighbor filtering as sampling strategy, we can calculate the sum of the encrypted voxel values along a viewing ray by the homomorphic add operation of Paler. After the sum of all rays for all pixels are calculated, the image is sent from the server to the client. The pixel values of that image are the encrypted viewing ray sample sums. If the client has the correct secure key, he can decrypt the image and normalize the sums. Normalizing means mapping the density sum to a grayscale color value. After the decryption and normalization, the final image can be shown to the user. For everyone who does not know the correct secure key, the rendering result will be just random noise. In order to improve the nearest neighbor filtering, we also implemented a trilinear interpolation for the voxel sampling. To achieve this, we make use of a floating point representation, which is also used by Google's encrypted BigQuery client. This is needed because Payless crypto system is only defined for integers. 
The idea of the floating point representation is to store the mantissa and the exponent in separate variables. Only the mantissa m is encrypted. The exponent e remains unencrypted. The base b is a constant like 2 or 10. With a floating point representation we can use the distance between a sample position and a voxel position as weight for an interpolation and calculate the tree linear interpolation in the encrypted space. A floating point representation can solve another problem because it can be used to perform the final normalization of a pixel on the server side. Usually the normalization is done by dividing the sample sum of a viewing ray by the sample count. However, this division can be approximated by multiplication with a fraction and such a multiplication can be done with this floating point representation. In our paper we discuss why the unencrypted exponent is not a security risk and does not leak any information. We also introduce a more advanced rendering algorithm, which has the same high security level as the X-ray rendering. However, it can highlight user-defined density ranges with user-defined colors. For this approach, the scalar voxel values of a volume dataset need to be encoded as vectors. This needs to be done before the encryption takes place. For two-dimensional vectors, you can imagine the encoding like mapping the density values between 0 and 1 to the boundary of the upper half of a cycle. This is just a basic 2D example. Good results can be achieved with a four-dimensional encoding. Important is that all vectors have a length of 1, because this makes it possible to compare to such vectors. Since it is possible to calculate the dot product of a vector with encrypted components, and a vector with unencrypted components. Therefore, it is possible to let the user define an important density and encode that density as a vector. The server can then use this plain text vector and calculate the dot product of this vector and an encrypted voxel. This results in an encrypted scalar value which describes the similarity of the voxel density and the user-defined density. This encrypted description of the similarity can be used as intensity for a user-defined RGB color. The sampling, interpolation, composition and normalization is based on the same ideas already explained for the actual rendering. The images on this slide are rendered with this simplified transfer function approach. The dataset was a CD and PET scan of the thorax from a patient with lung cancer. This approach is not like a pre-applied transfer function. All images on this slide are rendered from the exact same encrypted dataset. Only the transfer function was changed. We have now shown a volume rendering approach that keeps the volume data and the rendered images confidential. The rendering hardware cannot gain any knowledge about the data. Only the owner of the correct private key can make any use of the rendered images or the encrypted volume datasets. However, this level of security comes at the cost, because it has a significant storage and computational overhead compared to classical volume rendering on plain text data. But our approach is highly parallelizable. In fact, every pixel can be calculated independently by one processing unit, and no communication with other servers or the client is needed during the rendering. The images shown in this presentation are rendered by our prototype, which is a single-threaded Java application. The next logical step is a GPU implementation of our approach. Based on the runtime we measured from our prototype, we think a modern GPU server should be able to achieve interactive frame rates. Further research should address the visual quality of the synthesized images. For example, a homomorphic implementation of a gradient magnitude opacity modulation could be an interesting topic. Alpha blending would be very interesting, however, with Paler's crypto scheme it is not possible in a secure way. But with other homomorphic crypto systems, alpha composition could be feasible. Thank you for listening to my presentation about homomorphic encrypted volume rendering.
Okay, we're back, Sebastian. Uh, great job on the talk. Very interesting work. Uh, generated a lot of questions in the Discord, uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, the first question is from Alex Bach. He says, would you see a possibility to add support for applying an RGBA transfer function in encrypted space or another blending method uh, than adding the values before decrypting it on the client side? Um, yeah, um, I think uh, uh, I have shown a possibility for a transfer function um, on the on the server side for the encrypted data in my uh, talk. Um, and Okay, that question was asked early, so let, let's move on because we have some more that have lots of likes. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian Weiss <laughs> asked, can fixed point numbers be used instead of floating point numbers for fully encrypted numbers and interpolation? And Stefan Zellman uh, adds to the question saying, especially because medical imaging often uses 12-bit data like Hounds fun, uh, Houndsfield scale, uh, which conveniently fit into 16 bits, he notes. Yeah, it's theoretically possible to use uh, fixed uh, uh, point uh, variables, um, but um, it it does it makes things um, more complicated because the problem is I can't divide an um, encrypted number uh, on the on the server side, um, and uh, the floating point um, representation um, allows me to um, to approximate the deviations that are needed to to for the normalization. Uh, of some interpolations and um, I, I think the, the question was asked because of a security concern of the plain text exponent and um, we discussed why this uh, exponent um, doesn't uh, leak any information that is private because um, the exponent cannot uh, depend on um, a, an encrypted voxel value it just depends on parameters like uh, the projection matrix and so on. So it it uh, doesn't leak any information about the, the volume itself. Okay, um, we're, we're, we've run up into our time boundary. We have two questions left. Uh, one question I think should be quick. Luis Gerardo de la Fraga says, where are the public keys uh, stored? Um, the public key is uh, stored on the device that encrypts the data and uh, on the server. And probably the, the client will have it too because you can uh, calculate it easily from the uh, private key. Okay, very good. Um, I see Alex uh, says that you answered the first question. So we're set there. There's one more question in the Discord. In the interest of time, we're gonna move on. But if you could check the Discord and, and answer Sebastian Weiss's uh, question, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I will thank check. you very much uh, for the excellent talk, Sebastian. Congratulations on uh, your paper. Thank um, you. Our final talk of the session uh, will be delivered by Jens Schneider uh, from Hamad Ben Khalifa University, which is in Doha, Qatar. Qatar. Um, it's pronounced, or I'm sorry, the title is The Mixture Graph uh, Data Structure for Compressing, Rendering, and Querying Segmentation Histograms. Hello, everybody. I'm Jens Schneider. And my co-author Khaled Al-Selaya has joined me in this video below, as well as Marco Agus at the bottom. Today, I'm presenting the mixture graph, a new data structure for compressing, rendering and querying segmentation histograms. We as a community have worked with segmentations for decades now, but medical segmentations have always been annotations to modalities such as CAT scans or MRIs. In contrast to that, they have become a first-class modality in fields like neuroscience and material science. Here, volume data is imaged using technologies such as electron microscopy or industrial CATs. Depicted here are three such data sets. The two on the left have been obtained by electron microscopy, whereas the right one was imaged using industrial CAT. Such data is then painstakingly labeled, typically in a semi-automated fashion that is based on criteria such as the type of neuron or material. Once the data is labeled, the original volume is used less and less. This is particularly true in connectomics, where scientists are interested in understanding the topology of synapses in the tissue sample. Segmentation volumes pose a challenge for traditional rendering, since they store nominal data. As such, Interpolating or averaging between segments 
does not really make sense. In addition to the size of the volumes, this makes pre-filtered rendering and anti-aliasing a challenge. If we wish to assign optical properties to a segment in a transfer function update, we have to recompute large parts or even the whole mipmap, typically comprising of billions of voxels. The mixture graph in a nutshell is a directed acyclic graph that stores the computations necessary to perform a full mipmap update. It stores normalized histograms of segment IDs, which are obtained by recursive averaging of voxels at finer resolutions. We call these histograms mixtures since they tell us how to mix optical properties of segments such as RGB and alpha colors. To store mixtures efficiently and balance computation during rendering, the mixture graph factorizes mixtures into linear interpolations. We will now have a look at the main algorithmic components. Starting at the finest level, we construct a mipmap of normalized histograms. For simplicity's sake, we assume here that each voxel is labeled non-ambiguously, but the mixture graph also supports fuzzy labels. At level 0, each voxel plainly stores the ID of its segment. We then replace each ID by a one-hot encoding that is a standard unit vector with a single one and rest zero components. We then take averages over neighboring voxels, just as we would for building a traditional mipmap. However, since we cannot average the nominal segment IDs, we average these normalized histograms. As we progress towards lower resolutions of the mipmap, these histograms obviously will be getting less and less sparse, with the lowest resolution storing a single normalized histogram of the entire volume. We call these normalized histograms mixtures. They are convex combinations that represent prorated contributions of properties attached to the segments in the volume. Typically, such properties would be RGB plus alpha values, but they can, in theory, be anything. Computing the weighted average of properties based on the histogram stored in a voxel then gives the same result as first assigning properties to each voxel, followed by building the mipmap. Clearly, the data structure so far has a few undesirable properties. The work involved in propagating properties through the data structure increases when we go from fine to coarse levels. This makes rendering directly from the data structure very unbalanced. The coarsest resolution has to mix all segment properties. Also, as histograms get less and less sparse, storage overheads increase. This is where the mixture graph comes in. We take each mixture, embed it into a vector space of infinite dimensions, and factorize the convex combination into a sequence of linear interpolations. Here, the infinite dimension of the vector space is a technical construct to allow appending new values to vectors, thereby raising their dimensionality one by one. This is best explained in an example. Here we consider four segments, so we start by adding four leaves to our graph, called E1 hat through E4 hat. We store symbolic placeholders for these leaves in our initial mixture list, called capital lambda. Now we consider a mixture M, which is a vector over capital lambda. In this example, M means 0.1 times E1 hat plus 0.2 times E2 hat, plus 0.3 times E3 hat, plus 0.4 times E4 hat. We then pick two components in our M1 vector, here 0.1 times E1 hat, plus 0.2 times E2 hat. The mixing ratio between segment 1 and 2 in this case is thus 1 third to 2 thirds. We add a new node, labeled as lambda 5, to the graph, and we update both M and the mixture list. The update in M now means 0.3 times lambda 5, since the sum of the previous weights was 0.3. We then repeat this procedure until M itself is a one-hot encoding. Picking the two entries highlighted in red adds a new node lambda 6 to the graph, representing 0.5 times lambda 5 plus 0.5 times E3 hat. We update mixture and mixture list as before, increasing the dimensionality of the mixture by one again. Finally, we pick the last two elements, add a new node lambda 7, that is now identical to our original mixture. 
After this last update, we are finished. M is now a one-hot encoding. This means that we can now assign properties such as colors to the leaves in this directed acyclic graph, perform the computation stored in the graph, and read out the correct property from node lambda 7 for any voxel that originally stored M as a histogram. It is worth noting that edges in the mixture graph represent multiplications, whereas nodes represent additions. Therefore, the mixture graph stores computational steps to compute a lookup table for a map map volume storing symbolic references to segments and normalized histograms of segments. Clearly, situations can arise where nodes inserted into the mixture graph at a certain time may recycle earlier computations. In this example, mixtures M and M prime share computation of the internal node lambda 5. To increase the likelihood of such recycling and to store the mixture graph more compactly, we use scalar quantization of edge weights to increase redundancy. Using the symmetry of linear interpolation, we can further reduce the range of interpolation weights to the interval from 0 to 1 half. The main technical challenge is how to decide which pair of mixture weights will yield the most reward in terms of redundancy. The original search space is roughly on the order of n factorial squared, a result of the pick two dimensions and put one back factorization steps. In the paper, we present and compare two greedy strategies. The runtime of these strategies is mainly affected by the number of segments and their distribution in space. After having set up this machinery, it is time to reap the rewards, or in other words, what is it good for? First of all, the mixture graph allows us to perform pre-filtered rendering of segmented volumes directly on the GPU. This is achieved by assigning RGB plus alpha values to each segment and then propagating them through the graph by evaluating the computation stored in the mixture graph. This results in a color lookup table for the volumes that we can use for rendering, including level of detail enabled by the MIP map. Here we show fully interactive updates of two-dimensional transfer functions. We can also use the mixture graph to perform pre-filtered lighting of segmentation volumes. To do this, we quantize per voxel normals using vector quantization. The result is a codebook containing a sample vector per quantization bin and an index volume storing references into the codebook. The index volume is nominal data again, so we can construct another mixture graph from it, evaluating lighting contributions at the leaf, that is, for each normal in the code book, we then propagate lighting information through the graph and obtain properly pre-filtered lighting for the volume across all scales. This, however, comes at the expense that positional information is not available for lighting. We can also use the mixture graph to query distributions of segment IDs across 3D ranges of voxels. To do so, we assign one hot vectors as properties to the segments again. Propagating these one hot vectors through the mixture graph reconstructs the original normalized histogram. Obtaining a voxel count by segment at any level then corresponds to simply multiplying the histogram with the number of voxels in the support. That is, at level 3, we would multiply by 8 to the power of 3, or 512. Classical footprint assembly algorithms can then be used to compile the distribution over a 3D region of interest. However, since our quantization of linear weights is lossy, this distribution is not exact. We therefore also propagate the quantization error for each interpolation weight through the mixture graph using the laws of error propagation. Since the quantization is unbiased and convex combinations are numerically very stable, we are able to obtain results accurate within 0.5% of error. In addition, this method is up to 178 times faster than naive histogram assembly for a 256 cubed range with both queries executed on the CPU. Normalized histograms that can be updated efficiently across MIP levels also lend themselves to a very natural implementation of empty space skipping. By checking the alpha value at a coarser level, we obtain an average rendering speed up of three times.
The mixture graph accelerates updates of MIPMAPs since instead of having to update 1.2 billion voxels for the hippocampus dataset, we only have to update millions of graph nodes. In addition, our greedy strategy reduces 4.98 million potential nodes to around 20% or 1.03 million nodes. We observe similar reductions for the neocortex dataset, albeit the higher number of segments with their intricate spatial relations results in 5 millions of remaining nodes. The reduction is highest for the fiber enforced polymer dataset with its high number of thin fibrous segments resulting in few segments having truly global impact on the histograms. However, the main limitation at the moment is that for the polymer dataset, processing times are substantial. Our main future work will therefore be on finding better heuristics and greedy strategies. In conclusion, the main contribution of our work is to enable interactive rendering of segmentation volumes with interactive transfer function updates. The mixture graph further offers interesting features such as pre-filtered rendering and lighting. Thank you all for attending this talk. I will now be available for questions. Okay, we're back. Uh, Jens, uh, th thanks for that presentation and talk. Very interesting um, work uh, for, for a, a different sort of data type, but a very important data type. Um, I don't see any questions in the Discord uh, yet, uh, but I have a question for you. Um, at first, I, I thought this was because it was being delivered over Zoom that I saw as the data set was rotating around, it was fast, and then there was a, just a tiny little pause, and then it resumed. And I thought maybe it was an internet delivery. Uh, issue. But then as I, I saw the next movie and it showed the frame rate, it looked like the frame rate went up and down and you were achieving certainly a good frame rate. You know, I think I saw numbers as low as 7.7 .7 and as high as 14. Um, is this an issue that there's a variation in, in rendering rate? Is that a focal point for you as well? Um, so at the moment, the main focal point that uh, we are seeing in the future research is definitely the pre-processing. Um, but that's a good point because uh, this data is sparse and some of the data is sparse in one corner. And so obviously, if you're looking from the wrong side, then you traverse some of that sparse area. And although empty space skipping helps with that, we don't go up uh, all the levels to go directly to the uh, to the ISO surface because that adds other overheads. Uh, so this is the first time we use something like this. So uh, the focus is making it faster and better sure. looking across the entire yeah. pipeline, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand why the the for the most part the pre-processing times looked okay, but as you showed for the one, I guess the polymer data set, it was yeah. longer, and so I understand why that's the focus. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, but but also uh, you know. Um, yeah, so anyway, well, very good. Uh, well, thank you for the excellent talk and work. And uh, we're actually a little over time and I don't see any more questions on Discord. So I think we'll, we'll end the session, uh, but, but I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed seeing that work very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jens. Okay, and thank you to everyone for uh, calling in. Um, I think this was an excellent session. I really enjoyed seeing all the talks uh, and um, I guess I'd say enjoy the rest of the conference. I think there is a closing session uh, coming up here. So uh, thank you and take care, everybody. Bye. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought.
miss you. Indeed. We miss you being in New Orleans. We also miss doing what New Orleanians so often do best. Welcoming you to our city, telling you about our favorite places, and watching you truly experience the absolute beauty and indescribable magic of this incredibly special place. Everything that you know and love about New Orleans is not only here waiting for you, but it's better than ever. We have been busy getting ready for your arrival and have considered every detail of your visit with world-class dining, a brand new airport, new museums and attractions, and hotels to fit your every need and desire. Our world-class convention center is completing a beautiful new pedestrian park and is beginning renovations to other facilities. We'll even have gumbo on the stove and our musicians are tuning their instruments. So when it comes time for you to return, we'll welcome you back to our table and celebrate with you our 300-year-old traditions. And we know that you will create new ones along the way. Good morning, New Orleans. We love you, New Orleans. Just know that we're thinking of you here in the Crescent City. And we can't wait to see you soon. Love New Orleans. When people come, they never leave. Because we're swinging that way. The sun shines so, so bright. The breeze is so, so nice. Visualizations are about visual patterns, but there's more, much more. We show the connections between more than 100 arguments on why visualization works. And don't forget to check out our website. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. This has been successfully helping not only experts, but also people who want to learn about AI. At FAST 2018, we presented GANLAB, an interactive tool for learning about a deep learning model called GAN. But how does this help these learners? We conducted two evaluation studies, including log analysis of our demo used by over 100,000 people. We will be sharing our findings with you. We present our work on data visualization, a technique which helps facilitate understanding of physical measurements and quantities by providing visible experiences to users in virtual reality. This allows them to experience the ground truth of what the data is in reality as compared to the abstract nature of conventional data visualization. We hope our work will spur new considerations into how immersive technologies can be used for visualizing information and that you will find it interesting.
Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. In cancer research, it's useful to group patients based on disease spread patterns to the lymph nodes. But once we create a new clustering methodology using spatial data, how do we explain spatial clustering to non-experts? In this multi-year project, we dealt with both a participatory design stage and a broader dissemination stage, and distill specific lessons for interpreting spatial clusters. Language models are highly performant across many language understanding tasks. Comprehending the linguistic knowledge encoded by these models, however, remains a challenging problem. We introduced an approach for visually analyzing contextualized embeddings produced by language models. Our design shows how much context is captured by embeddings, the ability of embeddings to capture meaningful text spans, and linguistic relationships represented by the embeddings.